Welcome everyone to the ISN education webinar on hypertension. And uh, it's my pleasure to uh, moderate this session. Uh, my name is Sheldon Tobe. I'm a nephrologist in Toronto and uh, uh, expert in hypertension. And it was a pleasure to be invited to participate with KDAGO in developing hypertension guidelines for chronic kidney disease. And now is a very good time to uh, introduce our speaker today. Uh, Tara Chang is an assistant professor and she is an uh, assistant professor of nephrology. Also, um, uh, she's also a nephrologist. She works at Stanford and is the director of clinical research in the division of nephrology there. Uh, she has over 70 publications related to hypertension and cardiovascular outcomes and chronic kidney disease. She's a certified hypertension specialist and is part of the Stanford Hypertension Center, which focuses on providing innovative care for patients with severe or refractory hypertension. And I'd like to encourage all of those listening to also become hypertension specialists. And you can find that on our, uh, our website, American Hypertension Specialist Program. I will not take more of Tara's time and hand it over to her to begin the seminar. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Sheldon. And thank you for all of you for taking time out of um, your busy Friday to join us. Um, so I'll be speaking for probably about the next 30 minutes or so um, to give you an update on uh, a recent KDGO Controversies conference that I had the privilege of being part of, which was focused on blood pressure in chronic kidney disease. Here are my disclosures, probably the most relevant just being that I, I was a, a site PI for Sprint um, here at Stanford. So as I mentioned, uh, there, the KDGO hosted a controversies conference on this very important topic of blood pressure and chronic kidney disease in uh, the lovely city of Edinburgh, Scotland back in September 2017. And the purpose of this controversies conference was to identify areas of the 2012 clinical practice guidelines focusing on blood pressure in CKD um, that, that should be revisited. Uh, it's important to note that we were not tasked with actually rewriting the guidelines or, or even necessarily coming up with any concrete recommendations during those uh, three days of the controversies conference. Rather, it was just to review um, where there may be areas of, of new evidence since the 2012 guidelines were published, um, and that should be addressed uh, moving forward. And consistent with those 2012 uh, guidelines, we did not discuss patients on dialysis. As many of you know, the, the, that particular patient population um, is really sort of a population unto itself. And so we, we left uh, that group out of the discussion. Um, and there is currently a manuscript of these conference proceedings uh, that's in preparation and, and hopefully will be, will be published uh, soon. And so the, the conference is organized, um, as I think many of these controversies conferences are, into uh, a series of, of groups. So there were four small groups tasked with covering different areas in terms of blood pressure and CKD, and a wide variety of topics were, were covered. And so I'm, I'm trying to sort of organize them into these three broader topics of blood pressure measurement, blood pressure targets, and finally blood pressure medications. Um, so starting off with blood pressure measurement. Now in the 2012 TDGO guidelines, uh, there actually really wasn't much at all written about how and when to measure blood pressure. But um, as many of you know, this, this topic has gotten a lot of, uh, there's been a lot more interest in the way in, in which we, we measure blood pressure. So starting off, uh, and this happened to be the group that I was co-chairing with uh, Mark Sarnak out of Tufts. And so I, I probably had the most insight into how the discussions went for, for this particular topic. Um, but so we started off talking about these sort of standard blood pressure measurement preparations that have been really out there for decades now. And namely, um, probably the most important parts of this are to have the patient sitting quietly for at least five minutes before blood pressure is measured, um, having the right size of blood pressure cuff, um, and then the no talking. 
um, as well as that last recommendation there to have more than one measurement on more than one occasion essentially and, and maybe two or three is better um, despite these recommendations uh, over the years as we all know in a busy uh, kind of clinical practice these preparations uh, are uh, probably more often than not uh, not actually followed and so we talked about the different types of measurement options that are available um, in terms of the in-clinic blood pressure measurements, um, most clinics do what's been referred to in the literature as either routine or casual office-based blood pressure, OBP, it's often um, abbreviated as. And that essentially just means the blood pressure that you take that does not follow those standardized uh, recommendations that I just showed on the previous slide. And that's in contrast to a standardized office-based blood pressure, which really most often happens in, um, in a study setting rather than in, in routine clinical practice. This third um, type of blood pressure measurement is, uh, I think, worth talking about in a little bit more detail. So the automated oscillometric office-based blood pressure um, refers really to, to what was used in, in several trials, including SPRINT. And so what that means is that the, the cuff is placed on the, on the patient's arm, and then these automated cuffs have the ability to be programmed such that the healthcare provider pushes a button and, in theory, can, can at that point exit the room after the, the cuff is placed in the proper position and the button is pushed because these these devices have the ability to uh, be programmed to wait a certain amount of minutes and then take X number of readings separated by, you know, again, programmable differences, uh, a programmable period of time. And so in Sprint, um, the cuff could be programmed to wait for five minutes and then three blood pressure measurements were taken separated by one minute each and then a average blood pressure is, is um, output at the end and you can scroll through also and see what each individual blood pressure reading was and so because it's automated it, it uh, several of the sprint study sites um, in many cases the the patient was alone in the room and so the blood pressure was taken in an unobserved manner which um, to my knowledge hasn't really the, the effect that that has on blood pressure hasn't been studied in a very rigorous way but the, the assumption is that probably if the patient's alone in a room, uh, you know, he or she may have a lower blood pressure reading than what, would, what, what they would get if, if it was a more standard setting where the, the person um, taking the blood pressure is actually in the room with them. Um, home blood pressure measurements were also discussed. So most patients at home will use also an automated oscillometric blood pressure cuff. Um, and then uh, ambulatory blood pressure monitoring um, was also discussed during during our session. So here are um, some studies that have been uh, conducted comparing uh, these different blood pressure measurements that I just uh, described. And this was these tables are taken from a very nice review on this topic um, by Paul Draws and Joe Ix. Uh, this was published in Jason um, at the end of 2017. And it's a really, a really nice um, review. And so here you can see, uh, probably not very surprising to, to all of us who practice, uh, that routine office blood pressure um, fairly consistently gives you a higher reading than a standardized office blood pressure. So, you know, just the patient's running in, tried to park, you know, is running late, whatever. That blood pressure generally, as you can see, on the on the left side there, those readings will generally be higher than the ones where you actually wait and don't talk and all of those things. Um, as far as the automated versus standardized, so uh, the studies to date were done using this BP True device um, rather than uh, in Sprint, for example, it was an Omron automated oscillometric device. But the BP True generally functions in in, the, in, anal in an analogous way as what I described earlier. And what you see is that in contrast to the routine versus standardized, that when they compared the automated versus standardized, that the readings were really uh, fairly similar, and in some cases even um, slightly lower than what you get with the standardized um, measurement techniques. And finally, this table is showing you the um, 
clinic, and clinic is in quotes because all of these studies listed there were either uh, in the context of a clinical trial um, or a, a, a cohort study. Um, but you see there that the clinic SDP, which really is was sort of a standardized, or in the case of Sprint, an um, automated oscillometric blood pressure. Um, in each of these cases, that blood pressure in clinic was lower than what was measured um, on average uh, during using an ambulatory blood pressure monitor. So the clinic blood pressure was lower than the average daytime ambulatory systolic blood pressure. And so going now a little bit deeper into the out of office blood pressure measurements, so the home blood pressure readings and, and the ambulatory blood pressure readings, um, you know, these are really key because it's really measuring blood pressure outside of the office uh, that allows you to identify um, mask hypertension and white coat hypertension. And so I borrowed this figure from Slopnail Higher Math, who uh, is a nephrologist in Canada. And for those of you who are on Twitter, he's, he's very active on Twitter. Um, and so I, got, I borrowed this from, from him and you can see that you know, it's those two yellow boxes that are perhaps um, where, where the office blood pressure is discordant from what the home or ambulatory blood pressure readings are. And you know, if the office blood pressure is normal, and so you might think that everything is fine, but actually at home, they are not very well controlled. And so that's referred to as mask hypertension. Um, and then that's in contrast to a person who has white coat hypertension, which as we all know is high office blood pressure, but is actually fairly well controlled outside of, outside of the office. So why does this matter? Well, these abnormal blood pressure patterns are um, exceedingly common in patients with chronic kidney disease. And actually the prevalence um, is higher with uh, lower kidney function. And so you can see these percentages here of the prevalence of white coat hypertension, masked hypertension, um, non-dipping, just meaning that these patients don't have the usual drop in nocturnal blood pressure. Um, or they actually have a, a rise in blood pressure at night. It's a fairly big range um, because you know these numbers are taken from a, a, a wide variety of studies, and so you know there is quite a bit of variability. But you can see that in some cases, uh, you know, half of the participants actually, um, you know, that you might have thought were well controlled in the clinic had had high blood pressure outside of the clinic setting. And the reason why that's important is because those those last three abnormal patterns, namely mass hypertension, non-dipping, and nocturnal rise, are all associated with cardiovascular and with renal events in patients with chronic kidney disease. And in some studies, uh, had even stronger associations with these um, adverse events than in clinic um, blood pressure. And so the, the, the takeaway from our group on blood pressure measurement was number one, that, that any future guideline, <clears throat> excuse me, should explicitly state which blood pressure measurements to use. And, and like I said, the previous guidelines really didn't um, address uh, in any detail the, this issue of blood pressure measurement. And so it was felt by, um, by the conference attendees that you know, it was gonna be really important to, to think about blood pressure measurement. Um, and areas that uh, we felt needed maybe more, um, uh, you know, closer scrutiny was um, first whether to recommend the automated oscillometric blood pressure method for in-office uh, blood pressure measurement. Um, some of the other uh, guidelines, uh, such as Canada and one of the groups out of Australia, um, have uh, already um, recommended doing AOBP rather than um, uh, the sort of more usual way that blood pressure is measured in the office. Um, and another area that we felt needed to be revi revisited was um, when to recommend home blood pressure, ambulatory blood pressure, sort of you know how often and, and how do you use how do you use the readings. And we felt that <clears throat> more data was needed in terms of whether the abnormal blood pressure patterns that I described on the, on the last slide, such as non-dipping or nocturnal hypertension, whether they're actually modifiable. There haven't been all that many studies um, on this topic and the ones that are out there have somewhat mixed uh, results. And of course, 
a whether you can um, quote unquote normalize these abnormal blood pressure patterns and then you know the next question would be whether normalizing the blood pressure patterns would actually improve outcomes and and we felt like there there wasn't a whole lot of data on on those um, on those topics so shifting gears slightly now to blood pressure targets and um, I feel like you can't really talk about blood pressure targets without talking about sprint, which I'm sure all of you are very familiar with now, but just to give a, a very quick review of sprint. So the sprint was the systolic blood pressure intervention trial. The results, the primary results were published um, at the end of 2015. And this is showing you uh, the main results. So, so sprint, just to recap, randomized about 9,300 participants with um, hypertension and uh, at least one additional cardiovascular risk factor to either a target systolic blood pressure of less than 120, and that was the intensive group, <clears throat> or less than 140, which was the standard group. And we got pretty nice separation in blood pressure in the arms. And um, you can see here, so the primary outcome was a composite of fatal and non-fatal cardiovascular events. And you can see that participants randomized to receive intensive treatment had about a 25% lower rate of the primary outcome. Um, however, you will notice you could, uh, that the absolute um, rate of events was fairly low in the study. So, you know, 1.7% per year in the intensive arm versus 2.2% per year in the standard treatment arm. And so that would give you a number needed to treat of 200 patients per year to the intensive treatment arm uh, to prevent one of these um, fatal or non-fatal cardiovascular events. The, uh, the Kaplan-Meier curves look very similar for um, all-cause death as well, about, a, uh, about, you know, very similar to this. So SPRINT also had some important pre-specified subgroups. Um, so the, the study population was purposely enriched for patients with chronic kidney disease, perhaps most relevant to today's talk. About 30% had CKD, defined as an EGFR of less than 60. We also tried to enrich the population for older patients, for women, African Americans, and for patients with a history of cardiovascular disease. And you can see in this forest plot that um, within all of these subgroups, uh, the intervention um, worked equally well, um, at, as noted by the p-value for interaction there, which were all um, non-significant. You'll notice that the confidence intervals for some of these groups are wider because of the smaller, um, the smaller numbers of patients. So it's interesting to look at how different um, groups uh, revise their guidelines after SPRINT. So what this table is showing you here is um, each row represents sort of a different patient population that would be of interest, um, particularly for those of us who take care of patients with CKD. So you can see here, the first two rows are patients without diabetes but, and with, uh, with and without proteinuria. The next two rows are patients with diabetes, again, separated by proteinuria. Uh, followed by kid kidney transplant patients and older patients. And I'm, the first column, I'm just showing you what the 2012 KDGO guidelines recommended, which was essentially 140 over 90 for most patients, less than 130 over 80 if you had proteinuria, regardless of whether you had diabetes or not, uh, less than 130 over 80 for kidney transplant, although that was a, a fairly weak recommendation. And then um, for older patients, the recommendation was, was to sort of individualize treatment based on um, you know, the, the potential risks and harms in that particular patient. And you can see that, so the American Diabetes Association, the ACC AHA, the American um, College of Physicians and Family Physicians, um, the Canadian Guidelines, and, and the National Heart Foundation in Australia also released guidelines after, after SPRINT. And you can see that it's, it's really sort of a mixed uh, bag in terms of what the groups decided to um, go with. Uh, probably maybe the most stringent uh, recommendation came from the ACC AHA of less than 130 over 80 for basically everybody um, down the line. Um, and contrast that with, you know, the uh, ACP, AAFP guidelines, which really just focused on, on the patients who were older, which in, in this guideline was <coughs> patients who were at least uh, 60 years of age or older, 
and they essentially um, stuck with the old JNC8, uh, JNCA guidelines that said to aim for a systolic of less than 150 and only go for less than 140 if the patient um, is at uh, exceptionally high risk and did not give a diastolic blood pressure target. Um, whereas the, the Canadian and the Australia guidelines are perhaps a little more nuanced, saying to you know try for lower and more intensive blood pressure if they're at high risk or if you're really um, focused on stroke prevention, for example, or if the patient can tolerate it. Um, so it's really all over the place. And, and part of that, I guess, it maybe stems from, uh, and, and just anecdotally in, in talking with my colleagues and in terms of what we try for, is sort of, of course, balancing the potential benefit that I showed you with the first couple slides um, from Sprint, uh, balancing that with the adverse events. And so this being sort of focused on kidney events, um, we'll talk first about uh, acute kidney injury. So in Sprint, there was more acute kidney injury in the intensive group compared with the standard group, um, over twice as many AKI events. Um, you know, that said, uh, Mike Rocco recently published a, a really nice paper that took a, a deeper dive into this issue of AKI in Sprint. And he was able to show that, um, you know, most of these AKI cases were, were mild and most of them resolved. Um, although that said, there were definitely patients for whom that wasn't the case, and they um, seemed to have persistently lower um, kidney function than when they started. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, similarly, in Accord, so Accord, just to remind you, that was published um, uh, in 2010 and showed that in patients with diabetes, so Sprint, of course, excluded patients with a history of diabetes. Accord enrolled patients specifically with type 2 diabetes and randomized them to a blood pressure of less than 140 or less than 120, so very similar to Sprint. And that study also showed more AKI in the intensive blood pressure treatment group as compared with the standard. Um, the definition was, was different. Um, it essentially was a serum creatinine of more than 1.5 in men and more than 1.3 in women, which probably accounts for the reason why the, the, percentage, uh, the percentages are so much higher than what was in Sprint. And uh, finally, there was a recent uh, nice post hoc analysis of ASK and MDRD uh, trials, which again were two studies specifically in patients with chronic kidney disease, looking at a more intensive or uh, less intense uh, blood pressure target. <clears throat> and so Elaine Koo showed that um, for patients randomized to the intensive blood pressure treatment group in both of these studies, that if you had more than a 20% decline in your EGFR during the first three months, you then had a higher subsequent risk of end-stage renal disease compared with patients in a standard group who didn't have a decline in your EGFR. Um, so potentially a, a concerning signal there, but that was a post hoc analysis. Um, what about, so that was sort of more acute changes. What about sort of more chronic changes? So in Sprint, um, among the two thirds of the cohort who did not have baseline chronic kidney disease, there were more patients um, in the intensive group who developed incident CKD. So incident CKD in that group was defined as a more than 30% drop in your EGFR to an EGFR of less than 60. And you can see that, you know, almost a fourfold higher rate of incident CKD um, in that group. That said, about a quarter of those patients, again, this is going back to the Rocco paper, um, about a quarter of those patients actually had a subsequent improvement in their EGFR so that they no longer met the definition of incident CKD. And in um, Alfred Chung's paper, looking more closely at CKD um, and in, uh, um, in that case, they showed that you know, your EGFR, the, the drop in the EGFR appeared pretty quickly within the first a month or so, um, and then, but after 18 months, that difference stabilized uh, at a difference of around four and a half mils per minute. Um, and the other uh, maybe somewhat reassuring fact is that in Sprint, there was no difference in kidney events among patients with baseline CKD. And so the kidney events in that case was a 50% or more decline in your EGFR or dialysis or transplant. Um, in Accord, uh, more patients 
by the end of the study in the intensive arm had an EGFR of less than 30, so about twice as many as you can see, 4% versus 2%. Um, there were no differences in the development of ESRD or the need for dialysis. Those uh, were essentially uh, equivalent in the intensive and standard treatment arms. And they did note less ma macroalbuminuria in the intensive arm versus the uh, standard treatment arm. Um, of course, a major caveat for, for these and really any sort of randomized trial is that the duration of follow-up was um, when you're talking about you know, CKD progression or development of ESRD was relatively short. Um, Sprint was about just over three year follow-up. And so it's really not all that much time to develop these outcomes. Now there has been a limited extension of Sprint called Sprint Ask where um, we're inviting participants to come back and to give one more blood sample and one more urine sample to see what their creatinine has done. Um, but you know, that's adding on maybe another year, a year and a half of follow-up, which again, total follow-up time um, for these sort of CKD progression isn't, isn't that long. Um, but hopefully it, it may shed some light on, on what's going on in terms of longer term kidney function. <clears throat> so uh, there was a, an entire group devoted to uh, pediatric nephrology and <laughs> uh, full disclosure, I'm not a pediatric nephrologist, so I can't give a lot of uh, details on this, but um, the summary that came out of that group, uh, sort of the main points was that the American Academy of Pediatrics did revise their normal blood pressure values to be based more on normal weight children uh, in recognition of the rising prevalence of obesity in children. Um, the current recommendations on when to initiate treatment, so the threshold to treat in the KDGO 2012 was um, when the child is more than the 90th percentile for blood pressure based on um, age, height, and weight. Um, and that contrasts with more recent guidelines, which, which set that at the 95th percentile. Um, and the current KDGO treatment target in children is to get to less than 50th, uh, less than the 50th percentile of blood pressure, uh, particularly if the uh, child has um, significant proteinuria. And so um, in conclusion, in terms of blood pressure targets and CKD, uh, the following areas were uh, thought to definitely warrant revisiting, namely blood pressure targets in patients with and without diabetes, with and without albuminuria. Another topic that came up was whether to use albuminuria as a target for blood pressure treatment, regardless of what the blood pressure is doing. In other words, to just um, intensify blood pressure treatment if the, you know, so long as the patient still has um, significant proteinuria. And so that was an active area of, of debate and discussion. And finally, in children, um, it was thought that the blood pressure treatment threshold may need to be revisited given the new normative data that came out of the um, American Academy of Pediatrics. Um, but all the conference participants sort of agreed that there's a, a lack of data in certain very important subgroups, namely more advanced chronic kidney disease, so uh, patients who have an EGFR less than 45, patients who have both a history of chronic kidney disease and stroke, um, kidney transplant recipients, um, and then an older population of non-ambulatory nursing home patients, and finally, uh, children. And so the last sort of big topic uh, that I'll talk about today is the issue of blood pressure medications. And so again, um, I just wanted to focus on areas where the, this, there was discussion because of new data or new um, evidence that may have come out since 2012. And so there was uh, some discussion about the role of dual RAS blockade. So um, some groups have really uh, been more explicit in, in, in recommending not using a combination of ACEs and ARBs, particularly in those patients with diabetic nephropathy. And that's largely based on the, the several trials now showing um, no benefit of combination therapy uh, on cardiovascular or renal outcomes and a potential for harm, uh, namely hyperkalemia, more acute kidney injury, and maybe even faster progression to ESRD. Um, but uh, 
in, in the in the course of the discussion, there there was some question that you know there may be certain subgroups of patients who would still benefit from dual RAS blockade, um, namely patients who are able to uh, have lower levels of albuminuria on two agents compared with just being on a single agent. Um, the other topic that garnered a lot of discussion was the creatinine and what happens to your creatinine after you start a RAS inhibitor. Um, there's kind of this general rule of thumb that maybe a 25% increase after you start it, ACE or ARB is you know, okay, but that isn't based on very strong data. And there are competing studies and observational you know, using large, large observational databases showing that, you know, maybe even a 10% increase in your creatinine um, <clears throat> is a, a harbinger of, of poorer, uh, poorer outcomes down the line. Um, there's also uh, papers now looking not just at what happens immediately after you start a RAS, but maybe what's going on in the longer term in terms of creatinine variability. Um, and so, uh, so that was a topic that uh, potentially would need to be revisited in future guidelines. In terms of medications, blood pressure medications in older patients, there was a uh, discussion um, about this recent study um, called OSCAR, which was uh, conducted in about 1,100 Japanese patients who were 65 to 84 years old and who had a history of cardiovascular disease and or diabetes. And about a third of the cohort had chronic kidney disease. And the, the patients were randomized to receive um, sort of high dose ARB versus a more moderate dose ARB plus um, a calcium channel blocker. And all patients had a target blood pressure of less than 140 over 90. And the primary outcome was a composite of cardiovascular and renal events. And in the figure, you can see that among patients with chronic kidney disease, which is shown in panel A, that the uh, patients randomized to receive the ARB plus calcium channel blocker had many fewer primary events compared to patients with the, the high-dose ARB, um, whereas in patients without baseline CKD, there really was no difference among the two arms. And so there was some discussion about whether these results would um, warrant uh, maybe giving a different recommendation in future guidelines. Transplant recipients have all, were also a a key subgroup of interest. Um, so this was a, a nice meta-analysis uh, by Sophomore Higher Math that I mentioned earlier. Um, so he took eight studies, which were included about 1,500 patients, uh, kidney transplant recipients, and looked specifically at the question of ACE inhibitors or ARBs compared with some control. And depending on the study, the control may have been a placebo um, or may have been uh, some sort of active comparator. What you see is that in terms of death from any cause, there was really um, no signal. The relative risk was 0 0.96 and a p-value of 0 0.9. Um, similarly, for graft failure, the uh, relative risk was 0 0.76, uh, but was, was non-significant, as you can see from um, the p-value of 0 0.2. Uh, another recent study that was discussed um, was looking at chlorothaladone versus amlodipine in 41 kidney transplant recipients who were also on tacrolimus. And um, they actually measured ambulatory blood pressure in all of these patients. It was an open label crossover design. And the results are shown um, there in those four panels. So in panel A, what it's showing you is the median change in proteinuria. And while there wasn't any uh, significant change in amlodipine, when they were on the amlodipine, chlorthalidone, uh, with chlorthalidone, they did see uh, significant declines in proteinuria. And I should mention that the, the change in SBP was actually quite similar in the amlodipine and the chlorthalidone arms. Um, now, if you look down at panel C, though, you'll see that um, when patients were on chlorthalidone, their estimated GFR did uh, tend to drop compared with amlodipine, where it, it increased slightly. Um, but in panel D, this, this is looking at the subset of patients, so about 20 patients who were randomized to receive chlorthalidone first and amlodipine second. You can see that although the EGFR did drop while they were on the chlorthalidone, it sort of reversed after they came off the chlorthalidone and went on to amlodipine. So, you know, this is a very small 
study and short term, not looking at hard outcomes, um, uh, but but sort of of interest and, and was part of the discussion at the at the conference. And in children, so the 2012 guidelines um, recommend ACE or ARB, regardless of proteinuria, in children that you've decided to treat. Um, I don't think the group uh, found much other uh, new data in this area and uh, really felt that there was a need for future research on end organ consequences of ACEs and ARBs in kids, their long-term safety, and then really virtually very little information on pediatric kidney transplant recipients. And finally, just a, a word. So there was um, a, a area devoted to salt and sodium intake in the 2012 KDEGO guidelines that recommended less than two grams a day of sodium unless contraindicated. And that was actually given a 1C level recommendation. And um, the group that discussed this, I think, felt that uh, maybe it didn't warrant a 1C recommendation and, and thought that the revised guidelines may want to revisit that guideline, maybe try to focus it and tailor it more specifically to patients with chronic kidney disease and um, to consider recommendations not only for the upper limit of salt intake, but maybe even talk about the lower limits of sodium intake. So in conclusion, um, I think we came away from the controversies conference feeling like there, there definitely was enough data, new data, to warrant updating the 2012 uh, guidelines. Um, you know, specifically in the blood pressure measurement group A, just including blood pressure measurement, but talking about when and how to use AOBP and home BPs and ambulatory blood pressure targets, as I mentioned, revisiting patients with and without diabetes, albuminuria, and maybe the threshold to treat in kids. In terms of medications, maybe adding more uh, of a word on dual RAS blockade, EGFR changes. Um, but really, a, an important thing also that came out of it was to consider the feasibility and applicability of the guidelines in a global context. Um, remembering that, you know, recommending ambulatory blood pressure or, or home blood pressure in more resource poor countries may not really be feasible. So, to keep that in mind, as KDGO is supposed to be an international. Um, body. And then finally, um, I think many of the participants, uh, you know, felt strongly that the guidelines should also have keep an eye towards facilitating implementation. And, you know, it's all good and well to write a guideline, but if nobody implements it, then it's not very useful. So thinking about things like decision aids, maybe for patients um, and providers as well. And I will end there. Thank you um, for your attention. And um, I guess I'll turn it back over to Sheldon for questions. Tara, thank you so much. That was a uh, absolutely terrific talk. The, the, um, the, uh, you were talking about the, the increased risk of um, bumping the creatinine up uh, by 30% or more in, uh, in sprint patients with intensified blood pressure lowering. Uh, in your own practice, do you, do you find, is that a concern to you? Have, have you changed your practice um, because of that, are you afraid to lower your patients with CKD? Um, uh, are you afraid to lower their blood pressure according to sprint um, uh, uh, to sprint levels with intensification because of that concern about um, bumping the creatinine up uh, uh, within up to thirty percent more? Yeah. So so now I'm just speaking, uh, you know, as as myself, not on behalf of KDGO or anything, but I I do tend to. Um, to at least offer the option of intensifying um, blood pressure treatment for, for my patients with CKD. Um, and, you know, but I do watch what happens with their creatinine pretty carefully. Um, but I'll give, them, I'll give them time to sort of stabilize out. Um, there were some other studies, not necessarily SPRINT, but that showed, you know, if you start chlorothaladone, for example, that it, it can take a couple of months for the blood pressure, or sorry, for the for the creatinine to sort of um, level out again, um, but it will, and sometimes it'll even improve a little bit back to closer to the to the baseline. Um, so, but that said, you know, yeah, if the if the if the creatinine is really starting to go up by, you know, forty percent, fifty percent, and I'm just, it, that will make me nervous, and I will often sort of pull back. Um, 
you know, depending on the circumstances. Um, so, yeah, but I, I generally do, again, I was a, I was a sprint investigator, so I do believe in sprint, um, but I, I do tend to um, at least discuss the option of intensifying treatment for a patient that, you know, maybe before I would have said, oh, you're fine because your blood pressure is in the 130s, you know, now try to get them maybe a little bit lower. Excellent. And uh, I agree. I, I practice the same way. I think about it as a uh, uh, intensified blood pressure lowering is like starting an ACE inhibitor or ARB where we get a little bit of reduction of renal perfusion. And yeah. um, usually it's uh, it, it's sort of resolves uh, or, or stabilizes and patient just goes on. Right. Um, right. We have a couple of questions. Let's see. Um, 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 Muzumil uh, Ladiev uh, has in started a question but hasn't completed. So Muzumil, if you could uh, complete, oh, there you've completed it later on. Okay, hold on. Um, my question is: a patient without any comorbidities has a persistent blood pressure of 140 over 90, despite lifestyle changes, low salt, etc. Do I need to start antihypertensives according to AHA guidelines? Right. So, so according to AHA guidelines, um, I believe you would, you know, it depends on, even if they have no comorbidities, um, it depends, you, well, you know, see. they encourage, oh, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, sorry Jerry, let, let's say for this conversation that the patient does have chronic kidney disease, either a GFR less than 60 or uh, albuminuria. Yeah, so if the patient has chronic kidney disease, then then I think the answer would be yes, that, that you should treat them. I think the, and potentially this is where the, the questioner is, is asking is what about your very low risk patients, right? Um, right. So, you know, I think um, now when you use like these risk calculators that are, that are uh, advocated for use to calculate if somebody has a, a, a 10 year cardiovascular risk score um, of more than, I think it was 10%, um, then you'd want to treat. But if someone really like, let's, if it's like a young person and they, they have no other risk factors, uh, you know, then I think there's not, first of all, there's, there's no study out there in that population, right? Because that study would have to be conducted for probably decades before you'd get enough events to see what treatment or no treatment does um, in, in, you know, sort of a very, very low risk cohort. So, um, you know, so I, I think there's not a lot of data to guide what to do. Um, for me, again, it just comes back down to what my, what my patient, um, you know, the conversation I'm having with my patient. Um, I have just recently, I, I have had a 30 year old, otherwise healthy person, um, whose blood pressure is in the 140s. He's very healthy, you know, um, but his, his blood pressure is, you know, probably higher than it should be for, for a guy his age. And he is doing all the right lifestyle things, but he felt very strongly that he wanted to be treated. Um, and, you know, I, I, I agreed. So, so I started that person. Um, are, am I doing the right thing? I, I'm not sure, but part of me feels like, well, if he's 30, he's got decades hopefully of life left and having him run around with a blood pressure up in the higher 140s, you know, maybe not so great for his heart and brain and kidneys. Um, but that's my own practice and it's not based on a lot of data. I don't know, Sheldon, do you have a different view? I, I, I agree with you. And my, my brain says, uh, or my heart says in those cases, I really would like to lower the blood pressure. Uh, but my brain says I, I had better follow the guidelines. But if the patient is requesting it, and they understand mm -hmm. the risks and benefits, I, I'm happy to go along and gently lower their blood pressure. Yeah. Just as you did. Okay, here, here's another question. Um, what are your thoughts about if and when to use ambulatory blood pressure monitoring? And thanks to Maha Yahya mm -hmm. for that question. Yeah, so um, I use it, I tend to use it in my patient in a couple scenarios. So one is my patient who is insisting that um, they have white coat hypertension um, and that, you know, it's just because they're, they're seeing me, they get nervous um, and, uh, you know, they insist that, it's, that their blood pressure is fine at home. I'll also use their home blood pressure measurements, um, you know, especially if I've uh, calibrated it and made sure that what they get and the way that they measure it at home is, is 
uh, corresponds with what we get in the office. But still, in, in those patients, I will um, often suggest an ambulatory blood pressure monitor as well. And also in my patients who have very, very uh, labile blood pressure. So, um, and that's more of what my referrals are usually for the in the hypertension center. It's just people who notice that you know their blood pressure can differ by like 70 points depending on on the day or the time of day. So um, usually for labile blood pressure, I'll try to do an ambulatory just to get a better sense on it. You know, get more um, get more information essentially on on what's happening. Now, of course. It's a challenge to do ambulatory blood pressure monitoring for those of you that do it. I mean, a lot of my patients um, really hate it and they are like angry at me for making them do it. And they, you know, they're ripping them off in the middle of the night. And um, so there's always, there's that. And so I'm I'm kind of keeping my fingers crossed that some of these cuffless devices will finally actually come to fruition and we will have better ways of, of tracking. But, um, but that's what I do. Um, Excellent, and I, I agree, I, I practice the same. I think that ambulatory blood pressure monitoring is the gold standard for making the diagnosis of hypertension. And uh, those numbers you showed uh, from um, Swapnil Higher Math about mast hypertension, white coat hypertension, um, a, a lot of those, and, and knowing about the nocturnal blood pressure, um, the mast and mm, white right. coat will go away with the, with the 24 hour and it will be able to pick up particularly in our CKD population, those patients who have, um, uh, 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 who do not dip at night. Uh, right. But, it, but it, this, that it's, yeah. are you able to get it in all of your, do, do, you don't do it in all your patients though, do you? Or I'm just No, I, I would love to, but A, my patients yeah. <laughs> don't like it. And, <laughs> right. And B, okay. they have to pay for it. A, a Canadian patients particularly do not like to pay for any health care. <laughs> right. Neither do the Americans, but yeah. <laughs> um, there are no further questions have come in. Uh, Tara, any last words? Um, no, I think I just thank, thanks for everyone for, for sticking with us for the hour. And like I said, there, there should be a paper that kind of goes into much more detail of, of the topics that I covered here today. Um, that should hopefully be coming out in the next few months, I think. Fantastic. And I, I really thank everybody for uh, tuning in and joining.